Thank you so much for joining Dental Marketing Theory, a podcast by Gary Bird. In today's episode, Gary talks with Dr. Eric Roman. Gary and Eric discuss the importance of culture in your organization and the big reasons that it might be failing. As always, please make sure to like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment, as all of those things really help to get the word out about dental marketing theory. Hope you enjoyed today's show. All right, we are live with my friend, Eric Roman. So good to have you today. I'm super excited to chat with you. It's great hanging out with you, Gary. Like That's one of my greatest joys in life is when we spend time together. I feel like every time we talk, something really cool comes out of it. Maybe we'll have the same thing happen today. Let's do it. Let's do it. So first, um, you were the person that put me on to Costa Rica. Um, I went there. Amazing, amazing time. You were like, you have to go here. Here's the person. Like You connected all the dots for me, and I went there, and it was absolutely amazing. And I've told two or three other people who went and did it after me, so thank you for that. Well, guess what? I'm doing it again, January 23. No like way. we just got to keep the, we got to keep the Costa Rica beat alive. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And really quickly before we dive into this, if you're listening to this, it really helps us if you just leave a review down below. So make sure you leave a review. It helps me. Please don't make me beg. Take 10 seconds. I know you're hearing this and you're like whatever, I'm not going to do it. Please just go do it. It really helps me out. Okay, so So tell us about your dental journey. You have one of the most amazing stories getting into dentistry, what you built, what you sold, what you're doing now. Just could you just give us the the rundown on that? Wow. Yeah, that's that's okay. I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version. Um, The one without all the tears. Is that okay? Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. We'll avoid some of the tears. You know, um, why, why, why did you pick dentistry? Um, that's a really good question. Actually, I remember my dentist when I was a kid was like, Hey, you should become a dentist. And I was like, no, that's <laughs> stupid. I should do other things. And, um, but you know what? Can, like just truth. It was a really good balance of quality of life, assurance of success. Like you graduate dental school, you've got a pretty decent life. And so I thought I was just going to be a solo practitioner running, a running a solo practice, living a life. I got into dental school and I started like reading magazines, like who does that? Dental magazines. And I'm reading about just the industry and the business of it. And I did not know this. I did not know I was an entrepreneur when I decided I was going to be a dentist. And so in dental school, I realized, holy crap, at my heart, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't ever want to like just be practicing dentistry. I want to build a business. I want to build... I want to magnify my impact. So like somewhere in there, I caught on fire. Um, how, how, old did were you roughly? how old were you when you like realized you were an entrepreneur? Uh, I was probably 23. I was probably okay, so about 23. Still, 22. Still Actually, I, I, you know what's funny? I missed all the signs. I ran an eBay business selling <laughs> like electric toothbrushes when I was in, uh, when I, before I even went to dental school. I sold golf clubs on eBay. None of that ever occurred to me that I'm an entrepreneur. I was just trying to make money. (laughs) So, you know, go figure on that stuff. So, um, so uh, while everybody else is studying to get the last questions right on the exams in dental school, Eric's like doing continuing education on how to build businesses and traveling all over the country and trying to figure out how I can magnify my impact. Um, So uh, I get out of dental school and there's only one thought for me. I want to build a dental group. And, uh, of course I got out of dental school at the absolute worst time in the world to be wanting to build a dental group, uh, 2007 financial markets melt down. And I had all these offers for, um, lint from lenders like, Hey, yeah, you can build your business. And they, they pulled the money back. They're like, Hey, just kidding. Financial markets <laughs> oh, are done. We're not giving you any money. And so I'm like, well, crap, what do I do? So I, uh, I, I, backed into a really cool partnership with an existing DSO where I had carte blanche, um, it went great. I built the, their number one uh, fa- fastest and biggest practice in the country wow. in like 12 months. And then I did it again. And then I did it again. And I had a great business partner. We had a great business plan. We had a great market, but we did things different. And everything was great. I thought life was going to be living the high life inside the company until we got caught up in, you know, a lot of people know that in the DSO industry, North Carolina has a storied history of regulatory uh, scrutiny. And we got caught up in that. And I lost 100% of it. Um, in the blink of an eye, like in a lawsuit, it was me versus the and like, 
with the dental board and then the DSOs. And it's like, I'm in a lawsuit with people I love <laughs> and um, with what I thought was my future. So uh, Eric Roman has the uh, point where he wakes up years into his career and has nothing, no job, no assets. I thought I had $12 million worth of assets at that point. Now I have zero. And so started over again and decided this time I'm not going to let other people be involved in my journey in that way. Like it's time mm -hmm. for me to not do the one foot in, one foot out. Thankfully, the capital markets were better and people wanted to lend me money. I wasn't this like bright eyed, bushy tailed kid. I had a little bit of experience now. And so did it again. And, um, you know, with my business partners there in North Carolina, we built uh, a, a dental group there. Uh, we built the dental group that we wanted to have. We screwed a lot up along the way. Um, I'm really good at making mistakes. But um, <laughs> you know what was cool, Gary, is that when I look back, it was authentic to what we wanted. And when I screwed up was when I was trying to be somebody else. You know, when I was trying to build something that looked like what this guy did or what this gal did. So uh, long story short, though, kind of along that journey, I remember there was a day where I was sitting there kind of doing a check in. I, I ended up building like 10 practices and five kids over a certain number of years. Right. And uh, if you want to find a great way to destroy your marriage and your family, try doing all those things at once um, in a really fast cycle. I did that. And uh, so I was checking in with one of my kids who was at the time nine. And she said, you know, daddy, um, you work so hard and you're always gone and you always tell us like you're doing it so that we can spend more time together and make more memories. Nine more years, I'm out of the house. When's the day going to come? <laughs> and I was like, whoops, uh, dagger through my heart. And I'm so thankful for that sweet girl, you know, when she was nine years old, I decided that next week it was time for me to transition out. Um, I loved my company. I loved my partners, but it was, I was building a company for other people at that point, not for yep. me. And so um, that's when I decided to step down as CEO. We made a transition, had a private equity group came in. Um, and, you know, the company is many, many times bigger today. Uh, I helped to give birth to it. And now I get to watch other people raise it. And so I transitioned to a new life of uh, living different, living in new places, new geography, and sort of living in my personal unique ability, Gary. How'd I do with the Cliffs Notes? That's really good. So question, when you sold... Was it, did that go mm. as you anticipated or was it like totally different than what you thought that was going to look like? Oh, I got good news for you, Gary. There's no, uh, there's no training for what the process is like, no matter, I mean. I know, but everybody, everybody out there, I, I saw somebody post on, uh, online yesterday. They, they post a picture of Scrooge McDuck dumping into his money and they were like, this is what, this is what it's like when you sell your practice for a DSO, or this is what people think it's like when they sell the practice, yes. right? Yeah. And that is not the case. You know what's <laughs> funny, Gary? I, it was, that was almost three years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm still living with it every day because the IRS is auditing me for all the stuff because it's like all these crazy. So uh, no, it is not what everybody thinks. There's no training for it. I, I'm thankful because I was really clear about what I wanted to get out of the experience. And what I wanted to get wasn't also about the money. It was about me being able to do what I want to do every day. Mm -hmm. um, me being in the right place geographically and me having the space for the things that I say matter most in my life, which I said was my family. Mm -hmm. And so I got that. And um, did it look exactly like what I thought? Nothing ever does yeah. in life, right? Yep, yep. As much as we think it's going to look like this, it might look like that, but yep. never exactly what we imagine. And in many ways, Gary, it's a lot better, you yeah. know? But I actually, that's one of the things I take joy in right now is having the opportunity to teach other people what the experience of exiting yep. actually looks like and how to make sure you set yourself up for success. 95% of the entrepreneurs I meet, Gary, whether it's in dentistry or it's in other entrepreneurial circles, they always think it's about a number. Happiness never has anything to do with a number. Totally agree. And it is a rule. I know it sounds overused. I know we post memes about that. It's freaking true. So it's totally know. true. Yeah, no, I, I, one thing that I realized is that my happiness went through the roof when I stopped focusing on goals being bringing my happiness. And I started focusing on, am I learning? Am I growing? Am I, am I enjoying yeah. this journey? And I know it's, I, I, I know people say it, but it doesn't register as you're going through for everybody. Right. And when you really flip that switch, it's huge. So now you sold your business. And yeah. so you, then what happened? Like an entrepreneur with nothing to do is actually 
a recipe for a disaster, right? Like, so what did you jump into? Well, you called it, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I went through the disaster, you know, um, uh, now my bank account was was full. Uh, we moved across the country. We said, let's go live in the mountains. Let's go try a new life. I was at home all day. Um, my wife, I'm grateful she didn't murder me. My kids didn't know what to do with dad in the house all day long. Like we we're just all trying to figure out new routines. So what we did is we went from here to here, like yeah. the full 180 degree You're, shift. Oh, I'm not around enough here. I'm around all the time now. Yeah. And they're like, no, we don't want you around anymore. Get out. <laughs> And so what we realized was that our ideal, what we really wanted wasn't at 180 degrees. It wasn't the exact opposite direction. It was just a modification. Yeah. And it was important to go through that learning experience. Um, you know what, Gary, like a relative, you know, everybody, I, I, I love this. This is an Eric Roman quote. Everybody's chasing a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but we forget that we're riding on a rainbow, right? Yeah. Like yeah. how cool is that? Yeah. How do we find like our joy in the rainbow that we were on? And so now here I was and I'm like, well, I kind of have the pot of gold, but now I didn't have any rainbows anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was having to find joy like in different places. So long story short, um, I spent about a year like soul searching, going through different versions of Eric, like Eric version 2.0 showed up and then Eric 3.0. So a lot of personal reflection and personal work. Um, and then I realized I'm highly unfulfilled again. I was designed to build things and I was designed to create value. And this concept of me sitting back and just watching the world go by sucks. And so then I went two feet into life again. I built six different companies during COVID, <laughs> like six random. Uh, my, my attorney is like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like you were doing nothing. And now you just opened up six new entities and they're all doing different crap. So, um, I went to go create value again. You know something else I realized, Gary? Passive income wasn't valuable to me. I thought that life's journey was if you have great passive income, everybody's happy. <laughs> I realized passive income didn't validate me. It's like yeah. somebody, it's like, it's like social security marries you a check every month. Did you do anything? Not really. Yeah. I need to create value in the world. So I went on a new journey of value creation, Gary, and uh, built a bunch of different stuff, created a, not, a lot of new relationships. And, you know, I honestly kind of part of the self journey was how do I actually have the greatest impact on the world around me? Mm -hmm. How do I best serve people? What is it about the gifts that Eric Roman was granted that has the greatest value to other people? Which is it's an intriguing question to ask. Yeah. So the, so what was the what was the next steps there? You started to build those six companies and then where where did how did you end up to where you're at right now? Well, some of them worked and some of them didn't. Um, failure is one of the greatest things to learn to harness inside of life. And so I had to look at what failed about certain companies or what didn't work the way that I thought, oh, it's a no brainer until you realize, no, actually it's not a good idea. And, um, and so I learned through all those, I kind of refined where my energy was best applied. I realized, ooh, here's an interesting lesson I learned, Gary. All the grinding and all the hustle of building two dental groups over a decade, I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. In other words, like as I had learned and delegated a lot of functions, I just assumed, oh, I could take those functions back on any time. They killed me. Mm -hmm. They hurt my team when I tried to like nitpick yep. and micromanage and stuff the way I had in the past to build companies. And so I had to also own that there were some things that even though I'd done them in the past, I really couldn't do them anymore in the future. And that was heavy medicine. Thankfully, you know, I kind of right-sized into places that were my passion. I realized that I love supporting other entrepreneurs and team members that are in this dental space. I actually ran away from dentistry for a while too, Gary, yeah. top secret. Hmm. Um, I was almost ashamed of the dental industry some. I can admit that like here, and I'm not the only person that said that. And then I realized though, like, I love this industry. I love these people. And we're all, I realize we're all suffering too, in a lot of weird ways you experience in working with, the, with, with teams, yeah. we have like shared suffering. And so I wanted to use my, my experience to support others in it. That's awesome. And so what, what are you, what are you doing right now? Like what's your main focus? Like how do you spend your days right now? 
So um, recently, um, I forged a partnership with the DEO, the Dentist Entrepreneur Organization, uh, myself and my business partner, Josie Sewell. The DEO absorbed a couple of companies that we'd built over the past two years. One was a, a company that is helping to train teams, joyful people. And so they absorbed that into the DEO. Uh, also, Josie was, is, as we all know, dentistry's greatest guru in implementing uh, EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And EOS as a franchise and company and as an operating system had some gaps. And so we recognized there was a real need to design something that was super specific yeah. to the dental journey. And so um, in addition to that, the DEO absorbed some of my some of my personal coaching that I'd been doing for executives over the years. It was a really good harmony. The DEO is focused on multiplying dentistry, right? Yeah. So it's not for people that just have a dental practice. Yeah. It's for it's for entrepreneurs that have decided I'm either building a dental business or a dental organization, and so that's our journey. Um, that's the place that I find the greatest joy, and so we just kind of merge these two things together over the course of the past year. And uh, mergers are always hard too. That's yeah. the, uh, like, it's no different, no, no matter what type of company you're doing. So um, that brings me a ton of joy to be inside of there. And it's like my, those are like my people that I yeah. love hanging out with. So, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, where I, we are. Josie, Josie was my second podcast. So I was, I started a podcast and it was super scary, right? So I was like, I'll bring Josie on and she'll just do a great job of communicating and make my job easy, right? And so she came on and she was like, she did a great job, but she was like in that transition and she's like, I can't talk about it, but I can't, I, I'll, I'll mention it and we'll talk about it. Right. And so, um, it was yeah. so cool to see you guys go through that transition. I kind of saw you birth a couple of those businesses and it was, it's really cool to see what you guys are building now. And, um, <clears throat> I want to actually hit on that a little bit later, but I know one of the things that people are really struggling with right now, and I know you see it all the time is, um, acquiring dentist, right? You can't build a dental practice without dentist. Uh, that's, it's crucial. And there's a smaller pie and there's more dental practices. And I, I find it fascinating that the dental and everybody's like, we're going to build a hundred more practices, right? And everybody's saying that there's only so many dentists out there. It's like, someone's going to get left holding the back here, right? So what, what are your thoughts on uh, acquiring and hiring um, uh, associates right now? So uh, you're, you're the pro brother. Like, I mean, you're hitting the nail on the head. Uh, it all sounds good until we recognize that one of the growth limiters or maybe the primary as time goes on is going to be the dentists that we have inside there. And we know that our industry is shifting. We know that employed dentists inside of these yep. businesses becoming a bigger, bigger piece. It's actually something that a lot of dentists are more desirous of. That's what they want as their career. Yeah. Um, because of the complexities of, of, of it. But <laughs> as we said, it's a rate limiter. So what are we going to do? You know, um, when we built our dental groups, we built in a market nobody wanted to live in. And we were up against this problem before this problem was cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem is, how do you motivate somebody to join you in a place that doesn't fit their peer groups, their geographic desires or any of that sort. So we were, we were, we were recruiting in a hostile environment essentially. And so we had to learn that so much of our marketing, everything that we really did with marketing, we shifted our perspective from it being around new patients to being around driving, not just the quality of marketing that would bring in the dentists that we wanted to have, yeah. but also the other team members. We yeah. really looked at our marketing as our public persona um, and you know, what was really cool, Gary, is that when we started doing that, it was amazing because we would get dentists that would call us. And here we are in like the backwoods of North Carolina. Nobody wants to go there. Dentists would call and they'd be like, hi, I'd like to speak with Dr. Roman. Um, I've, I'm moving to the area. I've decided that I'm going to work in your practice. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, have we spoken before? Is there, <laughs> and it was because of that, that outward persona that we had created, we recognized that our dentists were just as much our customer as our patients were. Actually, if you think about it for growing and multiplying dental groups, I would make the case scary that our dentists and our teams are more the customer than our patients. We 100%. have to serve them and empower them. They are going to be the ones that serve the end customer, the, 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 patients, the patient, right? Yeah. So we had to really shift around the way that we approached everything we did. 
So um, one of the things that I'm noticing, so when you and I started in business, we got in, we learned from people who taught us, and I'm sure you've heard the same thing, that you get one job, you buy one house, you live in it forever, you get your retirement, and then you retire, right? Now kids, are, if you go online and you watch videos and you would listen to what people are being taught, now people are teaching Every year, you should be putting your application out there. Every year, you should be looking at other opportunities. Every year, you should be getting this kind of... And now with inflation, people are getting huge pay raises because all of a sudden, everything has adjusted. So it really becomes... So there's the recruiting game, but then there's the retention game. What, what are your thoughts around that? Well, you know, so, so one of the businesses we built, Joyful People, is about our teams and it's about retention. It's about... Honestly, what it's about is that the relationships we had inside of our businesses with our team members, Dennis or non-Dennis, for the past hundred years are done. It's changed. It's never going to be that way ever again. To your point, it's not, and it's not like, it's not, you know what, this is general generational dynamics. If you've ever studied generational dynamics, every gener every generation talks trash about the generations after <laughs> oh, these young kids, like they're constantly changing jobs and looking for, I mean, that's what our grandparents did to us. That's what we're going to do. And walking, that's what walking they'll do to there. school two miles uphill in the snow. Yeah. So, you know what you can, you like, I hear you. And like, it's fun. Like you can complain all that you want about the generation that's there, but you got to learn to ride it. Like it's a, it's a horse. And if you don't learn to ride that horse, you can complain that you don't have the horse you want to ride, but this is the horses that are in the stable and you have to learn it. And that's one of the big shifts. Um, we stopped fighting the change in dynamics and we started owning it and harnessing it. We stopped talking trash about the different generations and we started loving them and sitting there and seeing the benefits that, that us maybe not being so stuck in our ways mm. could, 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 so it, could sounds, it sounds like it started by with a, maybe a, learning. So it started with a mindset first with you guys, right? It was like, oh, you're not going to change totally. the job like, market. Just, and, and, and you know what, like to your point, um, our, our parents' generation taught us something and uh, that like their ideal was keeping a single job the whole career. Yeah. This generation is always going to be looking. And so we have to change our game. We have to change our game. Do you know the other thing though, that we, that, that we've learned Gary is that just because their games change doesn't mean they're more fulfilled. Yeah. And so yeah. one of the things that we had to own is that, you know, pleasing the generation is different than serving the generation. Right. And so a lot of the things, <laughs> like one of the principles that we had to own was we started talking to this new generation about whether it was a right time for them to transition out of our company. <gasps> like we asked them if it was a good time for them to leave. We asked them if we could help them find new jobs that are more in alignment with their stuff. And you know what happened? Our retention went up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Jedi mind tricks. Uh, <laughs> like, are you really serious? Are you asking me if I want to leave? And we're like, yeah, because we know you're probably looking like, you know, the supply rep said you are like, we know you are. How can we help you? We just want to. And so we started getting strategic about it and people started staying longer because we were saying, well, what are you trying to change? Well, I really just want a different schedule. Well, we could probably solve that here a lot easier than you finding a new job, yeah. you know? So, uh, man, it's a, and you know what? The book isn't written yet. As mm -hmm. much as I like to think that we've invented some really cool philosophies of communication with new generations, we still got a lot to learn and the generations move faster than ever. That's the other thing yeah. is that just when you get comfortable, something else is going to change. Yeah. We look at like the industrial revolution, right? It took a long time. And then you look at the dot-com bubble and that was like really fast. And now stuff now with web 3.0, it's moving like <laughs> lightning fast. Um, so let's talk about culture a little bit because you kind of touched on it. What are your thoughts yeah. on culture and how that should look inside of a dental practice and really inside of a, a DSO? What I And this is something that I've noticed from the outside is that you'll talk to a DSO and they're like, we have amazing culture. And you, you meet with the DSO folks and they do, but then you talk to the people who work at the office and they're like, I hate it here, <laughs> right? Like, like there's almost yeah. two cultures going on right now. And it's, it seems like there are some people that are solving that and working on that. But what are, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, there's a lot, you know, the first thing I want to point out, like everybody's talking about it, but it's hard, dude. Like if culture was easy, everybody would be happy right now. 
And yep. as much as uh, um, every dental conference I go to, that's uh, all anybody wants to talk about is culture. But to your point, uh, our scores aren't as good as we think they are. And, you know, and we're, you know, we all live with a certain amount of self-deception about what's really going on in our culture too. And so, you know, the other thing is that culture is expensive. I gotta yeah. be really, yeah. culture, culture sounds like a great investment to make until you're pushing out the money and, yeah. and like, well, not just like benefits, like, it's like, oh, we need, should probably give our team amazing health benefits. Right. And it's like, well, that's expensive. You know, you know, one of the things that, um, like cult, the, the, the easy thing about culture is trail mix, kombucha and benefits. Like we think that's what our culture is, right? Like, oh, we've got a kombucha bar we've got, and that's actually not culture. The hard thing about culture is it's our actual behaviors and our actual integration and like being true to what we said. And that's hard as crap. And that's why culture doesn't turn out the way we think. And so to your point, about what happens in DSOs, my experience is we have a macro culture and we have micro cultures, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, we experienced in our own in our own dental group this started happening because, <laughs> like, we had we had the macro culture, which was a a small set of shared behaviors and values that really define who the right people are, the things that we have fun doing, how we interact with ourselves and our and our patients, right? That's the macro. But the other thing we discovered is we had to, instead of trying to uh, force all that macro culture down everybody's throats, we realized micro cultures were still important, right? And that they were still going to happen no matter what. And what I mean by a micro culture is we, like, we realized we had this office that was like just a bunch of nerds and I love nerds, yeah. but they were like into, um, crazy role play games, like, like these, uh, like Dungeons and Dragons and all these, <laughs> they, they had this kitschy culture that was their own, that was important for us to leave space for. Because what happens in the world is we try to make our macro cultures just so strong that it forces out anything else. We had to learn that what, that, what best served both our patients and our teams was that we left a little bit of room for a microculture that wasn't ever in contrast that could be in harmony with the macro culture of the organization. Um, for us to think that in these mega dental groups of a thousand locations and stuff like that, that we can have one, one macro culture that everybody shares, that's just crap, dude. Like, come on, that doesn't happen in any company. And it's also not what our new generational dynamic of team members wants to own. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you scale? Like, what would be your recommendation if someone's like, I have a decent culture, right? I'm a, a doctor. I have one practice or two practices and I spend time around my team, but I want to scale it. I want to grow it. And I want to go to 10 practices or 20 practices. What would be some recommendations that you would talk about on that side? Yeah. The, the first thing, and you know, Josie and I have seen this now in working, we've worked with uh, over a billion dollars in dental revenue now. And we see the same thing over and over again. And the first thing that we see is that the culture is a facade and they don't actually practice what they preach. And I, and I did it too. I, I, I was pure in this, but your team, they're not idiots. Like a lot of them are actually IQ wise smarter than you. They've just made different life choices. So when, when you think you're fooling them, and when your behaviors don't match what you say the values of the company are, they know your culture's crap. It's not going anywhere. So that's the first thing, Gary, is that we really have to own and practice what we've preached and said in there. Second thing is less is more. Um, relative, like, because a lot of people try to build this like super complex, we have 974 core values that we define our behaviors by. No, less is going to be more, fewer things that we're more clear about how we exemplify them and how we don't. That's a really big deal. The third thing I would say, Gary, is being a broken freaking record. You know, we've seen the data yeah. points. We've all heard the thing that people don't, we can say something nine times before they absorb it. Uh, my joke is that, yeah, that might be for women. Men's probably like 18 times before they actually absorb it. But true story, we never, like our values didn't change. Um, and we would have every quarter, we did a company address via video where I talk about where we started, where we are, where we're going. I always reaffirm the values. One of my longest standing team members had been with me for like seven years at the time, had heard this core value speech probably 
two dozen times, right? Oh, man. And uh, we get there. She's like, hey, Dr. Roman, I love the new core values. I'm like, <laughs> what? Like, what do you mean the new core values? And she's like, the new core values are so good. It really resonates with me now. I really, I'm like, you know, I just dropped it. It took so many times for them to actually soak in, right? And then, so just being a broken record. And you know what? We actually have stories in our lives, Gary, about how we don't want to be broken records, how we shouldn't have to repeat yeah. ourselves. I yep. told you once, you should have remembered it. Yep. No, that doesn't match human behavior Correct. in our brains. And so the way I viewed it is my job as CEO was to be a broken record champion for the vision, the values, and the strategy that we were going to take to get there, which brings me to my last, isn't this cool? I just busted these out, Gary. It's really good. I didn't even know you were going to ask me that. The write a book. fourth one. You guys, you're right around the fourth company one around we have to, You guys kill it. Golly, dang, this is working. The fourth one is we have to reward around our values. That was a really big thing that we like to skip. Um, we have to sit there and acknowledge when people are exemplifying our culture, we have to acknowledge it and be really specific about it. So what we tended to do is we're like, hey, congratulations to Gina. She just did a new CE. Nah. -uh. Hey, Gina, living the culture, continuing education, you are exemplifying our growth value. Thank you so much for doing that. And like, Here's how we're going to reward that, you know? And so every week inside of our companies, we would do core value call outs that were shared across the whole company that continued to be into people's minds, what those behaviors really were, because we had to live it, you know? So what do you think of those, Gary? Those are really amazing, amazing. One question on the first one, you said a lot of, and I, I know this is true because I've talked to people too, as well, and I know you've talked even more that a lot of times the culture and the person running the show may not align. They want one thing, but they're acting another way at times. And that can be, that just blows everything up. How can somebody, in your opinion, measure their culture? Like, how do you measure culture? Um, you know, we use, we use a lot of, we use a lot of surveys on a quarterly basis with our teams. Yeah. Um, we ask really direct questions inside of it also, 360 surveys. And so what we would do is all of our teams had the response. When I was CEO, my teams were scoring me on how well I was honoring the commitments I'd made and how well I was living did you the do, vision. Did you do those value. blind as well so that you couldn't tell who is? Yeah, that's how we do yeah, it. Do you know what yeah. funny thing on that though? Nobody ever thinks they're blind. They're always like, oh, I'm scared to, I'm scared to answer truthfully because I know Dr. Roman's actually going to look and he's going to fire me if I... And so um, one of my rules on that, and that's really normal. Every company experiences that. It takes a certain period of, like all things, it takes repetition and time. As CEOs, we're like, we did it. It should be done yesterday. And what happened is it took a year. I'm four times going through that test when people seeing Roman's listening when we're telling him he's not honoring the behaviors, he's listening and changing his behavior and he's not attacking us for it. This is actually so a worthwhile good. examination where I can be truthful. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny because like we've, we've, we've talked in a number of companies about putting these types of feedback mechanisms in and the first one's just like, it's either it comes back like our company's perfect. And they're like, well, we don't need to do these anyway. Or it comes back like we hate everybody. <laughs> we hate everybody. Die. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I just like I've learned inside of this. I'm like, hey, guys, the first Two or three of these aren't even going to be valid data. Yeah. They're just going to be data that you have to take for a grain of salt and be consistent. And don't respond, and like don't behavior. respond negatively to it, right? Like don't, or positively because it's, exactly it's, right. that's like, it. oh, we got to fire everybody. <laughs> they gave me bad scores. Yeah. So, you know, um, and, and there is like, you know, I talked about self-awareness inside of it also. Do you know what it really was, Gary? It was why I grew as a human being. My people inside my companies are what challenged me to have to be a better leader and what changed my leadership inside my home. And it changed my leadership inside of me. What a freaking gift for us to be self-aware enough to allow. And, you know, like so much we talk about the big shift in the generational dynamics is that Generation Z sees us all as equals. We just have different jobs, whereas our parents' generation was hierarchical yep. and like top down and and I'm your daddy and you do what I say, no matter what. Yeah. And so like, as we're shifting, that's one of the things that I've had to embody and learn is that I have to be willing to receive those things that they say, 
but it will be to my benefit as time yep. goes on. Hundred percent. The other thing that I've noticed too with companies that have good culture <clears throat> and that they can measure it right over a long periods of time and they they retain their people right, so they really have a good culture is that they genuinely care about people. And what yeah. I've noticed is is when the when it's like, hey, we're gonna do culture to help our bottom line or our top line or whatever, like it doesn't. It may work for a little bit, but it always ends up falling apart. But if you genuinely care about people and treat them like you would treat your sister or your, you know, when someone's sick, you send them a note or someone, someone gets married, you celebrate, like you would do that with other people that you cared about. Right. And so just, just mm -hmm. caring and is, yeah. is really one of those foundational things as well. I think. Brother, I think that's the core. If we really took everything and we broke it down, it's it's like that we've said for so long in businesses, we care about our people. But 80% uh, say that they have great cultures where 20% really do, right? And it's just the the truth of it. And we've said it for so long, but we're just, it's just a cog or a lever to pull to try and get better yep. output. Yep. I see it regularly that people sit there and they just see culture. It's the lever I'm going to crank. Um, that's why they fail too, right? Yeah. That's why yeah. they don't make it. So when, when, when can we really just make it about loving other people? I mean, and Gary, you know, the cool part, what more does our freaking broken world need more than ever right now? We need less. I hate you less division and more. I see you for the differences that you have. And I love you nonetheless, because like, Cause I just do yeah, like where to... the crap did unconditional love go in life, brother. Yeah, no, I know. And it's, it's, there's so much negativity, right? It's so easy to focus on all the negative stuff. Um, but you can create a good work environment, a good, a place where people enjoy coming and they look at it as an opportunity and they're passionate and they're serving in their unique abilities. Like it's super fun when you get in that space. And I, I f almost feel bad for people that don't get there. Right. Cause it's like, cause we, I've lived on both sides of the fence as well. Uh, both yes. as a team member and as a leader. And it's, it's, it's so much better. Right. And I know, I know, I know you've experienced that as well. So changing gears on you, um, DEO map, tell me about that. Where's that going? What's going on with that? You know, Gary, when, um, when, when I look at what I went through over the years in building a dental group, there wasn't a recipe. Um, there wasn't anybody to guide me or to tell me what the next step was. Actually, there was nobody to validate even that what I was going through was normal. I just felt like an idiot some days. Um, a lot of self-admonition, a lot of like self-hatred, like I suck, all this other stuff. And what we realized is like, you know, honestly, a, a good dental practice can survive without a certain level of structure. Like yeah. it's delivering dentistry. But when we're trying to multiply, when we're moving into that business phase or we're moving into an organization phase, there is a significant level of structure that has to be there. And there was no map, Gary. There was a bunch of people sitting there just running into the same problems, drowning in the lake, falling off the side of the mountain. And we realized inside the DEO that there needed to be an operating system specific to the journey that we were on. You know, the, there's a lot of great operating systems out there in the world. EOS was one. Scaling up is one. There's dozens of them. Yeah. But none that were actually created to sit there and say, hey, we know what you're going through at this space inside of your dental business. These are the data points that after looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of businesses like yours, these are the ones that are best for you to measure. We, we kind of need those cliff notes inside the dental industry. And so that's what we built inside the DEO map. But we did something also that none of the other operating systems have done. We, we took a very human focused approach, right? Dialing in the importance of culture and what it means, mm. pausing to rest, really thinking about exit planning and other things inside of the operating system, because that's what our people are talking about on a daily basis. So yeah. truly there is nothing like it. Yeah. And to see the results and the peace and the comfort that it's giving people that are in the dental industry on the entrepreneurial journey whoo, brings us a lot of joy. Um, Josie and the, the DEO map team, Cami and Charles, our first set of implementers inside of it, they are just crushing it. We've had overwhelming demand. And so like, we're trying to build the plane 
like in flight and (laughs) dial it in at the same time that we're like getting additional passengers and there's a long line. So like, those are great problems to have. And you know what? Like we need an operating system too for how we do it. It's a good thing we teach that. That's awesome. That is so cool. That would yeah. definitely, if I ran a dental practice, that would be the first thing I would go to. Cause they're, like you said, it's not even like if there's nothing offered else offered, everything else is trying to fit a, a square, uh, a round peg into a square hole, right? They're like, Oh, you're building a business. So here, just do this. And nothing, nothing is that simple. Now tell me about the event in June that you guys are doing. What, um, uh, what are you guys doing at the DEO and what are you excited about that? What are your, what's your role in that? So the DEO Growth Summit, it's in uh, it's in Phoenix, the Phoenician Phoenician Resort. Josie makes fun of me the way that I say it, so I don't know which one's right. Um, epic Resort, and you know this meeting every summer is really designed to sit there and number one, it's one of the biggest gathering spaces for people that are in the DSO space and industry. If you're transitioning from a practice into a business or a business or an organization, these are your people. The vendors are people like you, Gary, that aren't just sitting there and saying, hey, let me help your practice, that know the challenges that people go through in the in this journey of multiplication. So it's like, if you're on that journey, these are your people. And this event is really designed for people that are asking the question, what is the DEO? How can they serve me on the journey myself? What is the DEO map? How might that benefit my my company and the on the on the on the process that we're going through? And um, you get incredible best in class, like shoulder to shoulder experience with people that are doing what you're doing. That's one of the most important things that the DEO has always offered. But now we're introducing this really direct step by step how to build an incredible dental group, right? And that's the new piece, having our own curriculum, our own intellectual property to hand people. Because for years, having this great community, our members have been like, hey, I love being with you guys. I feel like I'm not alone, but could you also just give me like the Cliffs Notes right now? Because I need some Cliffs Notes on some things. (laughs) Um, Things like, how do you build a clinical director program, right? Like, Mm. ah, I realized nobody's talking about it. Everybody's screwing it up. And so that's what the stuff we're stepping into. The Growth Summit, incredible speakers, incredible interaction, and incredible uh, locale. Who can miss with that, Gary? That is so awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. And, um, you know, one of the other things that I love about the DEO is every time I go to one of these events, the connections that I make with people in the industry. I'm a dental nerd, right? So I go into the marketing world and talk to people who are in non-dental. I'm like, I'm in the dental marketing. And they're like okay, what's, what's that like? Right. And so I, t- I start to tell them like, no, you have no idea. Like there's these entrepreneurs that are building these organizations and like, there's, it's not what you think it is. Right. And when you go to the, you, you, you know, it's there, it's like an ecosystem, but when you go to the, the event with the DEO, it all of a sudden becomes alive. It's like a beehive of all these people that I get to meet like you and other vendors that are there that just think differently because they're only in dental and they're only serving groups. Right. And so a lot of, a lot of hard problems are being solved there. And I, that, that is so exciting to me. So I, I get a lot of joy out of it. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. If anybody wants to reach out to you, how, how, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Man, I got a million ways. E Roman at DEO dental group.com. Um, uh, joyful people. Like when you want to learn how to apply this stuff to your team and, uh, and come to a conference, like come enjoy and try out the DEO. Let's sit shoulder to shoulder and really engage and get to know each other. That's where I realize like I'm at my best Gary. And so, uh, we ought to use it that way. Um, don't be a stranger, you know, that's, uh, that's the easiest way to do it. Awesome, man. It was so good to have you on. Thank you for just being transparent and vulnerable and sharing your whole journey, not just the the good parts and the bad parts. And I appreciate that. Um, it really helps me. And I know it, it helps those that are listening. Hey, the best parts are the worst parts because they lead to the best parts. And uh, I'm just thankful that I didn't cry on video today. So <laughs> that's awesome. it's a good one for us, Gary. Thanks for Thanks for being who you are in our industry, brother. Appreciate you.